Well, Bethel Church, we have a very special edition of Bethel Backstage uh, today. I am delighted to be joined with uh, our by Dr. Wayne Grudem. That name may or may not be familiar to you, but I know many in our church know his name and know of him. Uh, they may know of him, or you may know of him from uh, his systematic theology, which is arguably his most uh, well-known um, writing. I'll note to you the thickness on, on this particular book. Or maybe perhaps you have read his Christian ethics, uh, and I'll note to you the thickness of this book. But today we're going to talk about this book, which is Politics According to the Bible. And I'll note to you the thickness of this book. Dr. Grudem, can you write a short book? Is it possible? <laughs> I do have a short book called Business for the Glory of God. Okay, well, one then. Yeah. Quick read. All right, well, we'll look forward to the short ones because not. Right. I'm going to guess most people on this uh, that are watching this aren't going to probably read the big ones. But here we have an opportunity to get a little snapshot on a biblical view of government. You have written extensively on this, and we're studying this in Romans 13. And so we're delighted to have you uh, as a scholar, truly a true scholar and a theologian, uh, to help us think through uh, what this is. So uh, I'm just going to begin with this question. From your perspective, what is a biblical definition of government? I don't think the Bible explicitly defines government any place. It talks about a foundation for government in Genesis 9. Six, where God says to Noah, as Noah and his family are preparing to come, uh, are coming out of the ark and are preparing to start human society over again, God said to him, to Noah, whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Two parts to it. Whoever sheds man's blood, that is an expression for murdering someone. And, and God says, by man shall his blood be shed, that is, God is entrusting to human beings the right and responsibility to execute punishment, even up to the point of capital punishment. I man shall his blood be shed, put to death, as a penalty for murder, the most serious of crimes. And the reason is in the next verse, for in the image, or in the next phrase, for in the image of God he made man. And so it's talking about the exceptionally high value of human life and the uh, horrible evil that it is and the punishment uh, that, it, uh, that is justified. And then by implication, that means that um, for lesser crimes, lesser punishment would be appropriate, such as stealing. That's never a capital punishment offense in the Old Testament. Property damage is uh, fined or punished in other ways. In Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, there are more extensive descriptions of how government should function and what their responsibility should be. Um, and it's an organization set up to um, punish evil and reward uh, those who do good, encourage good in society. Um, Paul says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. So civil government is something that is established by God to, well, then, to do what? Um, <laughs> I, the Declaration of Independence is not, uh, and the U.S. Constitution are not scripture, but they were influenced by scriptural concepts. And um, the beginning of the Const Constitution says, um, I hope I can get this right, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect government, establish liberty, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, um, ensure domestic tranquility and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. I got a couple of the phrases out of order, but that's the idea. So um, to, to execute justice, to um, be sure that people who, do, who commit crimes get paid back for what they deserve. And that's to protect others from being harmed. And to ensure domestic tranquility, that's to maintain peace uh, and safety in our in the, old, in the um, beginning of the United States, in the colonies, but now in our cities today and, our, and through the whole country. And provide for the common defense, that's <laughs> protecting us against foreign adversaries and attack. Um, promote the general welfare, that is the well-being of the country. 
and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. That's protecting human freedom. So um, those are some purposes of government. Um, the Declaration of Independence also, again, I think reflecting some Christian values. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, which is shouting out to King George III of England, you don't have a right to rule just because your dad was king. Because <laughs> all people are created equal, and uh, that means no person has a right to rule over someone else just by matter of birth. And they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So that says God gives us rights as human beings. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we have a life, right to our life and our freedom and to pursue the good life uh, or a virtuous or worthy life in the way that we see best, the pursuit of happiness. Happiness not in a flippant light sense, but in a deep sense. Why are governments instituted? To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men to protect those rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And governments are just instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That is, that's key. You don't have a right to rule over me, I say to the government, unless I give you my consent. And so that establishes the principle of government by, um, by democracy, basically. Government by approval of those who are governed. That's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> but I think it highlights one of the things I think that when you look in the Bible and you and you know if you're a, a, a government want type person you you know you're you're looking for some uh, expansive philosophy of po of political theory and really what you see is you see uh, maybe uh, truths in the bud that yeah. now in the blossom of society. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have this expansive uh, government and, and so many things that it's involved in that, you know, largely go outside of the realm of what, of what the Bible said initially that government should be. And I'm, I'm, I'm hinting a little bit here for my next question for you. Uh, you know, if you think of the average American or the average American Christian, uh, you know, with a perspective on what government is or what it should be, what do you think is a, an aspect of of government that the average Christian, in terms of a biblical definition, maybe doesn't realize? Well, again, we're, we maybe don't realize the unusual nature of the situation that we live in, but um, I think of all the governments in human history, the kind of government set up by the U.S. Constitution is a model of what government should be, and it did two things. It gave the national government enough power to function, to, to restrain evil and promote good and protect the country. Um, and it limited the power of any one person or group of persons to have control. So it divided the power. So it's giving the government power, but dividing the power, separating powers between the national and state governments, legislative, executive, and judicial branches, um, requiring regular election of persons to office, and um, preventing tyranny, that's the point. So people for centuries thought there are kings in the Bible, you read the Old Testament, there are kings and queens. And um, that means must mean that kings are right. But um, we have Samuel warning the people of Israel what, what a king would do, and he would take and take and take and take and for Samuel 8, uh, and you'll be his slaves. So it's a danger of government always is it tends toward accumulating more and more power for itself. And when it does that, we lose more and more of our liberty and we become, we're moved from liberty toward enslave, enslavement. That's a danger we always have to be aware of, that government should protect our liberty. You know, it seems like every election cycle, and here we are in a, in a presidential election year, um, it seems like these years are always the ones when citizens become extra interested in government and extra interested in politics. Um, indeed, even perhaps I, uh, turning government into an idol. Uh, mm. You know, what is there as a theologian, if you think about like uh, the way that God made us and the way that government in a broken society, what it becomes to people, uh, messianic almost. Do you have any thoughts on 
why government uh, versus the sc- you know the school board or the softball club or something? Why is it government that becomes yeah. the thing that people look to? Well, I want to say two things about what you what you commented on, Steve. Um, first, uh, people are more interested in government during election years. I cheer that on. I think it's a wonderful thing for Christians to be involved and informed in government and make wise choices and and vote and perhaps do more, help a campaign or contribute to a campaign. That's good. The danger is if we begin to think that <clears throat> it's, a, it's a mistake I call <clears throat> um, do politics, not evangelism. Uh, that is, people begin to think that the only, that if, uh, if we just get the kind of government we want, all our national problems will go away. Well, the problem is people need a heart change people who do evil things in society and disrupt that society and harm others. And that heart change comes only through trusting in Jesus as their savior. Um, so the church has to continue to preach the gospel and build up believers so that believers are the kind of citizens that, um, that help a country rather than harm it or destroy it or bring destructive influences. Um, I think we need to have a lot of grace for people who think they should be heavily involved in politics and campaigns and even running for office and people who just think they should vote intelligently and that's all they want to do. I think God calls us to different tasks and he calls some people, I know there are Christians in my, in Arizona here who run for a state office or a national office and uh, others don't. And some people are very involved in politics and some are not. God calls us to different activities. But the Bible is full of examples of God's people, believers, who I look through the Bible to try to see were there examples not of believers influencing the nation of Israel, which was God's people, but influencing secular or pagan governments. And there were from Joseph, who was second in command over Egypt, to uh, Esther, who saved the Jewish people by risking her life and going in before the king to uh, Daniel, who was a high advisor to Nebuchadnezzar, John the Baptist uh, rebuking King Herod for all his sins in Luke 3, Um, and um, Paul before uh, Felix, the governor, uh, in uh, Acts, where he reasoned with him about righteousness and self-control and the coming coming judgment. And uh, Felix was alarmed, but Paul is bearing witness of, he's speaking to governmental lead, to a governmental leader about what, what is morally right and wrong. And I think Christians have an obligation to do that today, to speak to, vote and speak to government leaders. I, um, I remember once when I lived in Illinois, I went to a town hall meeting held by our congressman, um, John Porter at the time. He was a what would be known, I suppose, as a more liberal Republican, liberal on social issues. And uh, by waiting in line, I got to stand and ask him one question. I had, I had one shot, and so I said, Congressman Porter, when you stand before God at the final judgment, what will you say to him about how you voted on abortion legislation? <laughs> he blinked for a minute and then uh, said, well, I would tell him that I voted for the Hyde Amendment, and he began to talk about some of the good things he'd done, but it led to a conversation, uh, correspondence back and forth. And then uh, a little bit later, I got a call from his office and he gave me 45 minutes all by myself in his office in Deerfield, Illinois, talking about abortion from the text of the Bible and what it said. And I brought in some Abraham Lincoln material too, because Illinois has has a a little strong Lincoln connection. But um, that's an example of seeking to influence government for good. that, I think that, uh, that, be able to do that. that moment with uh, Congressman Porter, sort of the one shot, you were nervous, you wanted to get it off. That's kind of how I feel right now with you, just so you know. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, please well, don't. I, I, I don't. I have great respect for you. You have a much harder job than I do. Oh, well. There, there are two harder jobs than, than teaching seminary students. One is teaching junior high students. Amen. And one is being a senior pastor. I'll amen that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in your book, you you were kind of summarizing in that last answer a position that you lay out in your book 
where you encourage Christians to take the position of significant Christian influence on government. That's what you right. you called it. Uh, how is this different than maybe some of the other positions that people take regarding that relationship um, with between the church and and government? Well, in this book, Politics According to the Bible, I explain what I call five wrong views of Christian influence in government. One is um, compel religion. The government should force everybody to ha have the same religion. And that's what Muslim countries do today. But that denies the fact that genuine Christian faith can't be compelled. You can't even force your children to believe, say nothing of government forcing people to believe. So that's wrong. The other one is exclude religion from the public square. That's the ACLU and people want to take the Ten Commandments down from public buildings and take Christmas displays out of the park and things like that. Wrong to have compel religion, wrong to exclude religion. There's a, a different ground called um, number three uh, by Greg Boyd, a Minnesota pastor, myth of a Christian nation. And he says uh, government is evil and demonic and Christians should just not be involved in it. But at root, it's a very pacifist position that, that believes you don't, never should use force against to re restrain evil. And I don't think the Bible says that. Um, the fourth position is do evangelism, not politics. Church should never touch political issues. But um, I say, do you think it was right for Christian pastors to speak, preach against slavery in the 19th century? Well, yes, <laughs> that's a moral issue. And um, do you think it's right to, for pastors to preach against um, racism today? Well, yes. Well, there's a political issue there. You think it's right for pastors to speak about abortion? Well, yes. Well, that's a political issue. And so on and on we go. Um, and uh, there are many examples in history where pastors have had a wonderful influence on the country or sometimes harmful if they've been preaching wrong, wrong things. Um, so I'm not saying a pastor should speak about every political issue, but uh, the answer of when, when someone says, what political issues should I as a pastor speak about? The answer, the correct answer is not none. It's not zero. It's, uh, take the example of these, of, of um, Joseph in Egypt or Esther uh, or um, Mordecai or Daniel or Paul or John the Baptist speaking truth to government leaders. Uh, as we have opportunity, we should do that. So. Significant Christian influence is not compelling religion. It's not being silent either. It's attempting to persuade. And we, we as Christians aren't trying to force our beliefs on others. We're trying to persuade those in government leadership uh, that this is how they should uh, conduct themselves. So, and, and I find um, significant, significantly receptive hearing when I've had opportunity to meet with government leaders, especially uh, congressional representatives from here in Arizona. If, uh, if I've spoken to them about, oh, I had one of them come teach my Sunday school class at, uh, when I was uh, teaching at Scottsdale Bible Church. Um, Trent Franks came and he's a Sunday school class teacher in a Baptist church nearby. He came and taught, well, that was wonderful. And um, my own congressman, I've had a number of conversations with and he's just, interested in finding out what I think about biblical teachings regarding moral issues that confront a nation. Well, you did write a very large book on Christian ethics, so I could see why he would <laughs> seek you out. So would, so would I. You know, as a final point here, I think one of the things that you, that you mentioned in your book is that, um, you know, even if there was no sin, there would be government. Uh, yes, to uh, preserve order. There would be stoplights. Yes, there, there would be... <laughs> The, the government itself is not, um, you know, is not the brokenness of sin, that it's part of uh, a human society that's well-ordered and that reflects right. an orderly God. Yeah, and, and even among sinless angels, there are angels and archangels. So the government is appropriate even, um, even among sinless creatures. Mm -hmm. And someday in the in the future, uh, new earth there will be government. Jesus is yes. king of kings. It enforces yes. a, a yes, yes. rule. Yes, so, yes. 
Definitely. Uh, and, and that'll be, he'll be the king we'll all vote for. Uh, over, <laughs> uh, finally, a government that is, uh, is, is as God intended it to be. Right. Well, Dr. Grudem, we thank you so much for uh, joining us here. Thank you again for uh, your, your work and your writings. Um, we have used them over and over again in discipleship and me in sermon preparation. So uh, I just want to say on behalf of our church, thank you. Lord bless you. And uh, hopefully we'll get to uh, talk again some other time. Thank you, Steve. It's been good to be with you. All right. God bless. <laughs>